Find in your Bibles John's Gospel. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, that the days appointed for us are written in your book. Behold the sum of them. Lord, our length of life is not in our hands. That's in your hands. We would not want it any other way. So, Father, help us to overcome any kind of fear. Help us, Lord, to walk through this time with confidence, not in ourselves, not in science, but, Lord, in you. You're our strength, you're our rock, and you're our redeemer. So, Lord, I pray that you would honor and bless your word tonight as we study it. And I ask it, Lord Jesus, in your mighty, mighty, mighty name, amen. 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 Well, look at John 7 for just a minute. We'll take about five minutes to review, then we're going to get into chapter 8 tonight. We looked at John 7, the last couple messages that I preached, where Jesus goes up to the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, And he goes up there secretly from his brothers. Remember the story, his brothers are trying to get him to go with them. He says, no, and then when they leave, then he goes up secretly. So he's up there in John 7. In fact, look at John 7, 37. Let's read some from the text from two weeks ago. John 7, 37. Here's the last day of the feast. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Everybody say, that's me. If you're a Christian, that's you. But this he spoke of the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. They seem to have a measure of understanding or maybe even a measure of faith. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Once again, maybe some understanding, maybe even some genuine faith. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? All I can say to that is, duh. You know, do your research, idiot. That's exactly who Jesus is by after the flesh. He's of the descendants of David. He was born in Bethlehem. Verse 43. So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him. Eh, Wrong again. Go back and look at chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, but they have it. some of the Pharisees had believed in him. But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law, Nicodemus may have been a believer when he said this too, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet, get this now, arises out of Galilee, eh, how about Jonah and Nahum, both from Galilee, everyone went to his home. How many know that Jesus cried out in verse 37 through 53 saying, you know, in other words, this is the time, that's called the external call, that's what you and I are to do in being a witness to those around us, we can't change hearts, but we have been called to go into all the world and preach the gospel, can you say amen? Amen. That's the job the Lord Jesus has assigned to us. But the, what actually changes lives and hearts is not our call, it's God's call. And that's called the effectual call. Because when God issues that call, the response is 100%. This is the work of the Holy Spirit which causes the new birth. This is seen when Jesus called his disciples. They left with their occupation, whatever that may have been, and they followed after Jesus. That's the effectual call. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It was in Jesus' day, and it is in our day today. Everybody say, I'm a believer. The Lord did it. I didn't. Aren't you glad he did it? My goodness, because if he did it, guess what? You're done. Here's our memory verse. It fits our text so well. That's why I chose it from Mark 2. Two verses. Read them out loud with me, please. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors... They said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, 
but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous. Aren't you glad he came to, everybody say, that's me. I tell you what, he called me, I'm a sinner, and I'm glad he called me, I'm glad he saved me. So I want to read our whole text tonight as we begin. So look at chapter 8, verse 1, but back up to the very last verse of chapter 7. Everyone went to his home, but, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 1, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Caught in adultery. Imagine that. I, 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 and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. What's the first thing that comes into your mind? Where's the guy? Verse 5. Now in the law, they said, Moses commanded us to stone such women. He didn't say women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. I wonder what he wrote. I think he may have been writing a list of their sins. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. I mean, no, Jesus is in charge, is he not? Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, what's that next word? Isn't that awesome? She calls him Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either, go from now on, sin no more. Aren't you glad that Jesus came to save sinners like her and you and me? So look on your notes right there at that paragraph where it says text. After the Feast of Tabernacles, which was chapter 7, when the Jewish rulers failed to have Jesus arrested by the temple guards, they devised this plot to trap him. The trap is despicable and evil personified, but we clearly see the depth of our Lord's compassion, wisdom, and righteous justice. Here is a great message of hope for all who come to Christ Jesus. I hope that's everybody in the room tonight. We see how Jesus does not encourage sin, nor does he condemn those who come to him. We could say it this way. Jesus is the perfect union to justice, yes, but also to mercy. Aren't you glad that he came to you with mercy before he brought you to justice? My goodness. He paid the ultimate price at Calvary for sinners like me, and sinners like you, right now, as born-again people, we are citizens of heaven, clothed in Jesus' righteousness. We wear perfect righteousness, and I'm eagerly waiting for him to call us, everybody say home. Because we're not home right now, folks. We are pilgrims. Our home is in heaven. So I'll keep reading now. Sin's horror. I'm not referring to the woman, but the sin of these Jewish rulers. Adultery is sin, and apparently the woman was guilty. But compared to the sin of these men who were using her in an attempt to trap Jesus, her sin was small compared to theirs. And all I can say to that is amen. I want to show you these verses from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Jesus speaking. He says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure... It will be measured to you. It reminds me of these religious idiots that have got this woman here. Verse, next verse, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? You can let somebody with a log sticking out of their eye come and try to get the eyelash out of your eye? No, not on your life. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So these men who came to Jesus, they were trying to trap him, and this woman was simply being used as bait. They had already trapped the woman because under Jewish law at this time, it was necessary to have multiple witnesses to bring the charge of adultery before the, whoever the leadership was. So I don't know how the evidence was obtained. Obviously, it's a setup. And once again, the question that I asked earlier is still in mind. Where's the guy? If you caught her in the act, what happened there? Well, it's obviously not a genuine thing. Their dishonesty 
is clearly seen. Their hard hearts are clearly seen. At the least, regarding this man that was with this woman, they let him escape. Probably even more so, he was part of the plot and had his immunity basically beforehand. Talk about a double standard. This is pure evil that we see in the lives of these religious leaders. Reminds me of some religious leaders in our day. Look on your notes. Here is the problem in respect to the relationship with God and the sinner. How can God show mercy to the sinner without being unjust? Humanly speaking, it's impossible. This is what these evil Jewish leaders were thinking. Jesus cannot show this adulterous love or mercy. Not since the law says this. Yet God's justice, back on your notes, was fully satisfied at the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, it could be translated, it's paid in full. Jesus bore the full measure, the full measure, the entire cup of the Father's wrath for the elect. In other words, it was specific who he died for. And now by his grace, we wear Jesus' righteousness. Put your hand on your heart, look up and say, thank you, Lord, for clothing me in your righteousness. My goodness, Luther called it an alien righteousness because we didn't earn it, we don't deserve it. Jesus earned it as a man, but he did it in our place, and now it's been credited to us. So what does Jesus do? He ignores these idiots and begins to write on the ground. I don't know what he wrote on the ground. We'll have to ask him when we get to heaven. I'm sure he'll tell us. But after a few minutes, he stands up and he says, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Very simple, but also very disarming. I believe his words penetrated their hearts Maybe not because of the content of what he said, but because of the character of who he is. Hmm. Verse 9 on your notes. Let me read verse 9 again here. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Verse 9. Something about Jesus got through to these evil men, unrepentant as they were, (laughs) And they slinked away. Now keep reading. But they were dealing with God, with God the Son here. And with God, everybody say, all things are possible. Jesus spoke to this in Matthew 19. You might want to drop your ribbon there in John and go back to Matthew 19 if you want to read this with me. Matthew 19, 16. Here's another story with Jesus. Matthew 19, 16, And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into into life, keep the commandments. (laughs) Then he said to him, Which ones? I don't think any of us are stupid enough to say that. Which ones? And Jesus said, he gives a partial list here, You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leaves out the ones that pertain to God, the commandments. Verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, Jesus goes right to the heart of this man's issue here, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. What an invitation that was. But Jesus knew what his response would be. When the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished, and they said, Who then can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, read it out loud with me, please. With people, this is impossible. Amen. Everybody say, with God, all things are possible. That includes you, and that includes me, and that includes getting us all the way through the door of heaven. So look back on your notes now. This same truth, with God, all things are possible, applies to each one of us. Our sin was great. But God's grace is greater than our sin. Paul touched on this in Romans 3. I want to read these to you, these verses, these six verses. Paul writes, But now apart from the law, the law of Moses, the righteousness of God has been manifested, 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the law and the prophets testified of what was to come. Obviously, Jesus speaking of himself and his work. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For how many who believe? Everyone who believes wears this righteousness of Christ. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Next slide. Being justified, being declared righteous as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, propitiation, wrath removing, favor granting. Okay, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith This was to demonstrate his righteousness. He couldn't just ignore sin. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time. So that he would be just. In other words, God didn't break any rules in what he did for us. And the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I'm glad I have faith in Jesus and I'm glad Jesus did exactly what I need to get all the way to glory and to be clothed with his righteous robes. Can you say amen? So let's go back to John 8. Let's go back to the woman and the hypocrites. I want to read verses 10 and 11 again. John 8, 10 and 11. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. I love the fact she called him Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. <laughs> go From now on, sin no more. Look on your notes, John 8, 10, and 11. Jesus turns to the woman and for the first time addresses her. Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She answered, no one, Lord. Then in verse 11, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. From now on, sin no more. So here's the question. On what basis did Jesus say, neither do I condemn you? The only reason Jesus did not judge her is the same reason He does not judge those who come to Him in faith. Keep reading. At the cross, Jesus bore the full measure of God's wrath for every sin committed by those the Father had given to Jesus. In other words, Jesus' work was specific. It wasn't general. It identified and focused on a group of people, as it says on your notes, the elect who are also the redeemed. Keep reading. Forgiveness was not an easy path. Obviously not for Jesus. Jesus could only make forgiveness for her, and us by the way, possible by suffering in her place and our place at Calvary's cross. How could God forgive her and us? How can God remain just and yet forgive and make righteous sinners like us? Aren't you glad salvation is free? But aren't you glad that Jesus paid the price? Because it's not free. The price is something we could never have paid, but Jesus paid it through His life of perfect obedience and through his sacrificial death at Calvary. Now keep reading. This is going to be tough for some of us, maybe not in this room, but it's tough for a lot of people who are believers. Jesus' redemption was specific. Now read on. Jesus bore the sin of a specific group of people at Calvary. Yes, it was a world of sinners, but specifically those whose names were written in the book of life from before the foundation of the world. These are the elect of the Old and the New Testament. Those are the saints of God. So back on your notes. If you are a believer, Jesus bore your sin and God's wrath for you. Read that word out loud. In other words, it wasn't a blank check. If you're a believer, your name was written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. Before God created the world, Believer, your name was in his book. Revelation 13.8, it's not on your notes, but listen to to what it says, Revelation 13.8. Those whose names were written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Who are they? They are the elect of God, going all the way back before Adam and Eve were made. Keep reading. Here is the only solution to how God can remain just, and he is, and yet justify or forgive sinners like this woman and you and me. To us, salvation is free, only because our Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God, paid the price for us. I'm so glad He did. Thank you, Jesus. Here is the gospel. Keep reading. Then Jesus told the woman to stop sinning. Now, this is an important part for us today in the the life that we're living. 
This always follows God's forgiveness of our sins when we are saved. Every genuine believer, I put genuine there on purpose because a lot of people claim to be believers and have no evidence in their life. Every genuine believer fights their sin. They're not perfect, but they're certainly striving to live a life that's pleasing to our Lord and Savior. That's the heart that we have now that He's put in us. Here is the new nature of being born again. We hate it when we sin. Everybody say amen to that. And we should eagerly anticipate our Lord's return when we will be glorified. And guess what? No more sinning at that point in time. What are you going to do in heaven to sin? You're going to be face to face with Jesus in a glorified body. No more sin. Wow. Wow. So Christian, here's, my, here's my, one of my closing thoughts before we get to our conclusion. Keep fighting your sin. Don't you dare stop. Because you are forgiven, you're born again, you're made righteous, the Holy Spirit lives in you. John Owen said it very well, and he died in 1683. He said this, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Mm. Turn to the right if you're in John, and go to 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5, I want to read verses 17 through 21. 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in other words, if you're a believer, that's you. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things, all these new things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now read verse 21 with me out loud. Here would, this would have been a great memory verse as well. Here we go, read it. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God when I discovered the reality of that verse, I had probably read it a bunch of times, but when the truth of that began to hit me, it totally changed my life. I was raised in a culture religiously where basically we got saved every Sunday night because we knew that we had failed somewhere during the week and we were taught that if you fall and sin, you forfeit your salvation, you got to come back and get it again. That's not the way it works. Aren't you thankful for that? So... This woman caught in adultery was forgiven by God, forgiven by our Lord Jesus, who died for her sin and the sin of every believer. Now go to Psalm 103. We're almost done. Psalm 103. I know this is a very basic message, but boy, this is a basic truth that we need to be reminded of. Psalm 103, verse 10. I love this one verse particularly in our passage we're going to read. That's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Psalm 103.10, he, speaking of God, God has not dealt with us according to our sins, thank God, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. And this is the verse I love, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I don't think the psalmist knew about the earth's structure. I don't. I mean, he could have said as far as the north is from the south, but now we would read that as, and we would say, well, wait a minute, there's a north pole, then you're going south. Come on. As far as the east is from the west. <laughs> Verse 13. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He knows what we're made of. He is mindful that we are but dust. Aren't you glad that your salvation is in his strength and not in yours? So look at your conclusion on your notes. Yes, it was a short sermon. Conclusion, although I'm not done yet. <laughs> conclusion. Jesus says to the woman, go and sin no more. This was her instructions after seeing Jesus for who he is. Here is the sanctification. In other words, here's fighting sin for the believer. Here is the sanctification, which is the job of every believer. Scripture says that the soul that sins must die, Leviticus 18.20. So how can Jesus say to her, 
I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. Well, the answer is obvious to all of us. The answer is that Jesus knew he would bear her sin and our sin on the cross and that he would pay the full penalty for her adultery. In other words, the penalty for adultery was death. He died in her place. My goodness. He knows those who are his. And every one of those who are his are like this woman. We are redeemed sinners. In John 10, 11, Jesus speaks of him being our shepherd. He says this. Now compare the life of the shepherd with the life of a, a, a sheep. What a, what, a, what, a, what a difference. But notice what he says. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I think about the value of my life and your life. And I think about the value of Jesus' life. That verse makes a lot of sense. Think of who came and lived and died for you and for me. Oh, my goodness. This adulteress was one of his sheep. All I can say to that is, bah. So aren't you glad that God gives what he requires? What he requires is perfect righteousness. That's exactly what he gives. St. Augustine said it this way, God, command what you will and give what you command. So keep reading on your notes. Romans 8, that's your homework this week, has much to say to believers regarding sanctification, which simply means our pursuit of holiness as we fight our sin. Not everyone is a member of God's family, and you know that and I know that, but a lot of people would say otherwise. They say, oh no, we're all God's children. That's not true. Only those who are born again. So those who are born again, there's a difference in their lives. The Bible says that the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. Here's Romans 8, 12. I want to show you these three verses. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit, notice the capital S, the interpreter understood this is speaking of the Holy Spirit. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There's sanctification. Be fighting your sin. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Let me ask you a question. How many Christians fight their sin? It better be every cotton pick and one. That's right. Because if you're not fighting your sin, you have reason to doubt whether you're even saved. Because the new nature is in us, the Holy Spirit is in us, and God is working out His purposes. So keep reading. As we see in this woman, seeing Jesus for who He is brings about a new nature. Every Christian hates their sin. That should be true for you as well, as it is for me, and should fight it. Keep reading. The new birth is a profound change. Before salvation, we were in Adam. Humanly speaking, we descended from Him. But now, being born again... We are in Christ. We've been born from above, the Scripture says. Wow. Here is deliverance from sin's power and its judgment. And let me say this. When He comes, it's going to be deliverance from sin's presence. Here is eternal life and growing in holiness. Next thing on your notes. This change is accomplished in us by God. Amen. It is supernatural, divinely imparted. This change also has sealed our future. Aren't you thankful for that? There's no question about your future, Christian. There's coming a day when every believer will be changed. And I've got one more scripture passage I want to read. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll be done. First Corinthians 15. And then go to verse 50. First Corinthians 15, 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood, speaking of just humanly speaking, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. In other words, Jesus is going to come. Some of us are still going to be alive. Behold, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Now this is what the change is going to be, verse 53. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, read it out loud, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I wrote on my notes after that passage of Scripture, eternal glorification, eternity in the Lord's presence, forever removed from sin's presence, not to mention we'll still be together as God's family. I tell you what, that, it don't get any better than that. That's our hope and our future. So Donald Gray Barnhouse writes this. The Bible teaches perseverance and not perfectionism. Everybody should say thank God on that one. Because if we say we have not sinned, we lie and we are not telling the truth. That's how John puts it. So the Bible teaches perseverance and not perfectionism. Our perseverance is described in Scripture as a walk, which is after the Holy Spirit. All of this is a process of development began by God, notice this, and carried on by God. In other words, the work that he started in you at salvation, he's still working. It's not you. I mean, yeah, you're working on your sanctification, but you only do that because he's at work in you. Wow. Listen to Psalm 138.8, one of my favorite verses. Listen. The Lord will perfect or finish that which concerns me. <laughs> his mercy endures forever. He does not forsake the work of his hands. 